Okay, welcome to CIP Office Hours, everybody. Um, so in the last one I did, um, Lambda had been asking about uh, tile sets and tile maps. So we talked about uh, storing tile maps in a 2D array and storing them in a 1D array. And then we talked about how you could have like a sparse tile map. Um, we talked about how you quantize just random coordinates into a grid uh, and then take grid coordinates and turn them back into just world space. Uh, and then we talked a little bit about tile set design and pixel art stuff. Uh, we talked a little bit about um, auto tiles, but I wanted to cover them a little bit more. So uh, the first thing we're going to talk about um, is a kind of tile set called the rug or the nine slice. Um, in Unity, there is a nine slice thing I believe you can use, unless I'm misremembering. A lot of game engines have it because a nine slice is useful for things like uh, UI. Um, so like if you want to do like a dialog box or something, the frame and the background of that dialog box can work as a nine slice. And what a nine slice means is you'll have a corner, like you'll have four corners, right? Which would be these tiles here. And then you would have borders, right? on each side, and then you would have an interior, which is this one. Um, so if we turn this on, so we can draw any like convex rectangle, just like a plain little rectangle, and it will work. Um, and you only need nine tiles to do this. Uh, and it's useful for doing, like I said, like frames of windows and things. Sorry if I'm a bit rambly today. I'm a smidge sleepy, but anyway. Um, you can't really do anything with like a single tile, so people will just usually have it be the center um, because that makes kind of the most sense for this. Um, this, a nine slice is a little bit limited because you can't, for example, do like a single row. Like if you do a single row, uh, it doesn't really work um, because you don't have enough flexibility here to handle that. You also can't really do concave shapes right because it there's you just can't um i'm not as organized as i wanted to be with this uh, so let's talk about how this works real quick so um i wonder at penny's live demo well thank you um so what the way that this sort of thing um, which i'm just going to refer to as auto tiling would normally work um, if you, if you're doing a nine slice and drawing some UI, you probably do it at runtime, but if you're building a map, generally you compute your auto tiles once and cache the results, um, because doing auto tiles every frame on every tile can get expensive, right? So if you're playing like Terraria or Starbound or something, um, the cute little borders between all the different materials, those are auto tiles and those presumably get computed and cached, right? Because there's thousands of tiles on screen at any given time. And then whenever you like mine out some tiles, um, it goes and recomputes the auto tiles just for the tiles you've changed and their neighbors. Um, but for this example, we're computing uh, which tile to draw for every tile, every frame. Um, so the way we do this is we use a simple bit mask. So each direction is assigned one bit. Um, so east is going to be the first bit, south is going to be the second bit, which is two, west is the third bit, which is four, and north is the fourth bit, which is eight. So what we do is um, for any given tile, like let's say we're talking about this tile here, tile three one, so we'll go and we fetch each of its neighbors and then I'm just shifting it over by whichever number of bits it needs to be. Um, so if that neighbor exists, and then this is binary or, so I'm mixing them together, basically. This is, you could think of this as addition. So this is either one or zero plus, either four or zero plus, either uh, two or zero plus, either eight or zero. And we get one number, and with that one number, um, since we have four, possible bits, right? That's two times two times two times two. So we have um, 16 possible resultant numbers, right? 
um, from 0 up to 15. So each one of these numbers represents a different arrangement. So if the number is 7, it means that we have a neighbor to the west, to the south, and to the east. Uh, and then we also have, um, and so we have all of these, but some of them are redundant, right? We have 16 possibilities, but we only have 9 tiles. So actually, we can take these and we can collapse them down to just the nine cases that we actually have. So as you can see, for all of these cases, we just draw the center tile because we can't handle like a vertical strip or a horizontal strip or a corner. Uh, let's see. So that's how this works. And then we have another type uh, which is called the fence. Um, this is very similar to the nine slice. Uh, the difference is we have a vertical strip version and a horizontal strip version. And we have, um, people generally do this for like, if there's a single tile of the thing, they'll use this corner for that just so it's not wasted. Um, so if I, so if I go draw just, you know, the single tile, no auto tiling, whatever, um, an interesting property of quote unquote the fence, which I've drawn some pipes because pipes are easier to draw than fences, is you notice that the corners are always empty. Like on every single one of these tiles, the corners do not connect. Um, fences only connect on the centers, right? The centers of edges and the corners are always empty. What that means is even though it even though this bit here is similar to just, basically it's an extended rug, right? We have these nine and then we have these extras for skinny bits, but because the corners are always empty, we can make concave shapes and it still works. So if I turn the auto tile on, you can see that we can have these concave corners, right? And it's fine because the corners of the artwork are actually always empty and the connections happen on the centers. Um, this will come up again later, but it's, yeah, so you can have the same rules apply differently based on the actual artwork you're using, um, because the artwork kind of dictates how the connection should work most of the time. Uh, anyway, so now the third and most complicated auto tile I'm going to cover, uh, is called the blob. Um, and the way the blob works is the blob is a subset of a more complex tile set that has, I think, like 256 different tiles in it. Um, basically, the blob is a way to cheat a little bit. So I can draw rectangles, like the rug. I can draw skinny bits. I can draw concave corners. But basically, I can draw anything, and it will connect properly. Um, and the way that this works is we could, so the, like I said, there are 256 possible neighbor results, like, but what we do, uh, oh shoot, I forgot to mention. So like I said, the fence works the same as, um, the rug, except, uh, we actually have to use all 16 cases because we have 16 different tiles. So we have nine and then three and three and one is 16, right? Um, anyway, sorry for getting off track. So the blob again, apologies. So I've written lots of comments here that I am probably too flustered to go through properly. I really need to clean up source code so I can give it to you guys. So there are 256 possibilities, but we do a subset of 47 tiles that we create. But you'll you'll note that my tile sheet here does not have 47 different tiles in it. Um, instead, I have 24 sub-tiles. So this is a trick that I'm borrowing from RPG Maker and others um, because it lets you make a lot less artwork and it's um, pretty cheap to compute. So, um, the way this works is, uh, any given tile is split into four subtiles 
A, B, C, and D, where A is the top left corner, B is the top right corner, C is the bottom left corner, D is the bottom right corner. Um, and the way this works is each subtile, when you're building a whole tile out of four subtiles, any given subtile in this sheet can only go in that slot in a whole tile. So an A subtile, so this one or this one or this one or this one, can only go in the top left corner of a tile. Um, and having that rule allows us to simplify this process a lot. So here's sort of how the sheet is laid out in subtiles. So basically for every tile we want to draw, we need to figure out what the four subtiles should be. So we get our neighbors, and now we don't just care about direct neighbors, we also care about the corners. So if I'm looking at this tile, I need to check all eight of the surrounding tiles, including the diagonals. So those are included in here now. Um, so we have six, uh, eight things to check. So going through them logically, so if we're looking at A, uh, hang on, I'm trying to remember where my things are. Yeah, okay. So if we're looking at A, the top left subtile, um, there are three different directions that matter. So if we're looking at the top left, then we have to care about the west, the north, and the northwest. And we only have to check those three tiles. So we're checking three whole tiles per subtile, if that makes sense. So we just grab them all at once, and then we use a bit mask to pull out the three that we care about. And so for each one of those, um, we effectively have five subtiles. Now there are six in the sheet, um, but the first one is just kind of an extra thing if you want to have a single tile version um, of the tile set. But in terms of actually auto tiling, um, these are redundant and only the remaining five actually matter. But so since we have three things, uh, three bits that we have to care about, that means there are two to the three or eight different cases, right? So for each one of the subtiles, A, B, C, and D, we have to consider eight possibilities, which are combinations of the three different neighbors that we care about for those. So after doing that, we can then go, some of them are going to be redundant, um, and so we can collapse it down because, like I said, we only have one, two, three, four, five, six. We only have five possibilities, so even though there are eight um, numeric results, we can collapse it down to five cases because some of them will behave the same. Um, so this is actually not all that much code really <laughs> to make something like this work. Yeah, sorry, that. thank you, Charles. That's a nice diagram. Um, I made them hoverable, but that doesn't help you guys. <laughs> um, but, uh, so after this, uh, I don't have a good demo for this because I was trying to think of what I could do and I was like, well, eh. So all three of these auto tiles and generally auto tiles period um, are an implementation of a mathematical thing known as Wong tiles. So if we go over to a Wikipedia, so Wong tiles, are just a simple concept of you have tiles or dominoes that are all the same size and they have colored edges. And the question is, can you tile a plane by only putting matching edges together? Um, so this is pretty abstract, but these are used for lots and lots of things. And our auto tiles are basically just a, um, version of this and we've kind of baked it into our source code you can also you could make sort of a just generic wong tile system and like feed information into that um but we didn't we just hard coded like the possibilities right so there are different ways of doing this so 
we're talking about like colored edges, but color here doesn't have to mean a color. It just means sort of a classification. So you can say there are so many types of edges. You can also say there are so many types of corners. So if we go back to our examples, uh, and I'm going to pull up a sprite. So here I have the rug that's over here, right? and I've drawn some edges over it. So red edges are outside edges and green edges are interior edges. And so you can see how they fit together, right? So the switch statement that we've written um, that processes the neighbors is applying these edge rules to the tiles. Uh, and then we also talked about the fence which is similar to the rug, but remember the corners of the fence tiles are always empty, including the interior corners. So it actually changes a little bit um, how they work, right? Because we can have those concave shapes, right? That's because all of the interior and exterior corners um, are always empty, right? So, and then for the blob, this one is the most complicated and my diagram isn't perfect. Um, there's a mistake in it, but I ran out of time. So strictly speaking, I don't need all these colors. Um, the blob has two corner types and two edge types, but I've colored all of the corners to try to show how they fit together. Um, and there are some errors, like here's a blue on yellow on this border, for example. But I wanted to do this to kind of illustrate that like there are sensible mathematical rules happening here. It's not just voodoo in a switch statement that nobody knows what it does, right? Um, I did sit down and go through and individually write all of the case statements um, just logically. Um, so it's, it's not magic, but, um, anyway, you can see how the corners are always touching the other, the same color of corners, right? In theory. Uh, and I have another example of this. I found this great website. That's the wrong thing. Okay. This website is really cool. I'm going to go ahead and paste this for you guys. Um, this website has loads of examples of different long tiles. So here they've made essentially the extended rug, which is a set of long tiles with two edge colors. And there are 16 possibilities, right? Uh, and they've got their own bitwise thing, which they've used different numbers than me, doesn't matter. Um, they've got an example tile set, and then they have a randomly generated map using those tiles, right? Uh, and they have lots and lots of good examples. So if we go to their example for the blob tile set, um, they talk about how it works. This is a great article. I would highly recommend this if you are curious. So I'll go ahead and post it. Um, there are two edge types and two corner types, um, which is how you get all of these possibilities. So here they have made all of the different tiles. Um, and then uh, somebody wrote an algorithm to try to pack these into a more minimal set, um, which gives you 49, a 49 um, tile thing, but there are 47 tiles that actually count, right? Um, and then of course, I don't know if they talk about, okay, yeah, they don't even cover the like subtile trick, um, but right, as we discussed, you can pack these 47 tiles, like if you don't mind, splitting your tiles into quadrants, you can take these 47 tiles and turn them into 24 subtiles um, and do way less artwork, although things will look a little bit more video gamey, perhaps. Um, but that's another really good example uh, for Wong Tile stuff. What else do I have? Okay, I was going to talk a little bit about procedural generation. Um, which is maybe too fancy a term for any of the things that I have done. Um, and 
I did not, I ran out of time. I didn't get to all of the topics that I wanted to, but I will cover a few things briefly. Um, so one way to generate sort of organic shapes is Perlin noise. And I don't know if I actually need source code for this one. I might, where is a good example? Perhaps there's not one, oops. Um, so Perlin noise is a way of generating a continuous gradient and uh, so here's a nice fuzzy grody looking example. Um, Perlin noise is just a continuous noise function. So you can have Perlin noise in any number of dimensions. Since this is a tile map, I'm doing two dimensional Perlin noise. Um, if you cared about something like making a looping, like if you wanted periodic Perlin noise so that you could do like I don't know, a 2D world that's supposed to be the surface of a planet and you want it to have seamless edges, then you could do like a higher dimensional Perlin noise, like project it onto your 2D Perlin noise. I'm not going to talk about that at all, <laughs> but it's cool. Um, but anyway, so most math libraries will have some variant of a Perlin noise function. I am borrowing Eskil Steenberg's because I don't know how to write my own and he's a good programmer that I trust. But anyway, so I just have this function, which we can go and look at, um, which just generates continuous noise. And then what I am doing, um, so for my inputs for X and Y, I'm taking the X of the tile, which is the tile index divided by the map width in tiles. So I'm getting basically a fraction of what, how far through the map every tile is. Um, and then I'm scaling it by some factor, right? And that factor is dependent on time. So if I hit play, this will continue generating um, just to the right indefinitely. Um, so the way that I'm turning, so there's this gradient on the left um, and I have it just in black and white, but then I also have one where I've tried to color it kind of like seas and islands based on the values, is it just gives me back some floating point fraction, and then I can do with that whatever I want. Because I know it's going to be a continuous function, I can go and I can say, okay, well, everything beneath this value I'll say is water, and everything above this value I'll say is land. Or I can say everything beneath this value will be empty space, and everything above this value will be tiles, right? Uh, and I don't remember what my threshold is. I should have made a slider for that too, but I did not. Um, let's see, threshold is 0.55. So it's a little bit more than half of the tiles in theory will remain empty. Um, there's also like different octaves of noise that like add more like little, like small details to large features, that kind of thing. Um, God, I'm so disorganized today, sheesh. Um, I don't know if anybody has played older versions of Minecraft, but I think they removed this, but back in the day, you could go to an advanced options menu when you were creating a world, and it would give you all of these options for the world generator, and a bunch of them were basically just factors that affected the Perlin noise that they were using um, to generate terrain. Um, a common use of Perlin noise um, at least historically, I feel like we probably have better things now, but one of the common uses is to generate a height map. So if you're like, I want to make a land with some high mountains and some low valleys, you could use Perlin noise for that. And you would feed in different, um, you would basically build up this crazy formula um, so that you could like accentuate certain aspects to make, you know, maybe high peaks and then smooth out other bits to make rolling hills and like that sort of thing. Um, so there used to be all of these floating point numbers with these inscrutable names in the Minecraft advanced world generator options. Um, and they were primarily things that affected um, what was done with the Perlin noise or what was fed into the Perlin noise function. Um, but so that's that. And so you can use Perlin noise to generate just a height map, which you could use to create like a world map 
or to create um, like any sort of cloud shaped thing really um, but every basically any generational thing any time you're trying to generate some content you are going to need to make it tweakable and you're going to need to tweak it and play with things and turn dials until you get a result that you actually like um, it's a very experimental thing to try to do to like write a level generator or something um, so just bear that in mind um, something else I wanted to talk about is Cellular Automata or Conway's Game of Life. Um, cellular Automata is just a system where you have a grid of cells, individual cells, and wow, I didn't fix that. And each individual cell can either be on or off. And each cell, each iteration is governed by these three rules. So if a cell has less than two or greater than three neighbors, it will turn off. So this cell would turn off, right? Actually, if I just put it there and hit play, it will turn off. If a cell has two neighbors, nothing will happen. And you saw this cell fill in, and that's because if a cell has three neighbors, these three, it will become alive, right? So this is a great example of how really simple logical rules can create really complex emergent behaviors. So I'm just drawing a little shape known as a glider, and you'll see that it will just kind of waddle uh, indefinitely forever until the end of time. Um, but there are lots of complex behaviors that you can get with this. Uh, and in fact, there's kind of a whole metagame with these of creating what are called spaceships and generators and um, growth formulas. It's like a spaceship is, uh, so you can see certain shapes are stable, like three in a line is stable. It will create this kind of propeller motion. Four in a box is stable. Uh, four like this is also stable, I believe. Um, but there are lots of different shapes that have different properties, and there are whole different classes of arrangements of these things that people have invented um, to create really complex, interesting behavior. So I'm going to see if I can find a favorite, which is uh, Cellular Automata Star Wars. This is absolutely ridiculous. So... This, this person's version is colored, but, and this is also a very large game board, but just the, the level of complexity in the behavior is amazing. And it's just these three simple rules, every frame, that's it. Just those three simple rules. Um, so this on its own, you would not probably use to generate a map or anything, um, but we can leverage the, the idea for something that will. So because we have these simple rules, we can just tweak those and get different results. So here is a custom one. So we're going to say, if we're alive and we have less than three neighbors, die. If we're alive and we have greater than eight neighbors, die. So we have a low and high bound um, outside of which the cell will die. And then instead of three, we've set our limit for how many neighbors we need to become alive at five. So if I go and generate this map, we can get these kind of smooth shapes. And there's a treasure chest there. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, this is a little bit hurt by the fact that the tiles are so large. I probably should have used some smaller ones. Um, but you can see how the cells interact with each other, right? And create these stable, um, vaguely organic shapes. Um, and all I'm doing is I'm just iterating it until it becomes stable. And then I'm saying, okay, we're done. Let's go place some treasure, right? Um, it's worth noting that there are different ways you could do this, right? You could do a set number of iterations, for example, or you could do a set number of iterations with these values and then change into a set number with different values. Um, like, let's say I lower the death threshold. Now we get more small spaces and little annoying corners and things. Let's say I raise it. 
the whole map just disappears because nothing can sustain itself anymore. Um, and that's interesting. If we lower the high value, I think it'll also destroy everything. Okay, we got some infinite loops. So if a cell dies from having too many neighbors, what that means is we can't really have filled in spaces. We will always end up with hollow spaces, um, which is generally not desirable uh, if you're trying to make caves or something, right? Um, we can also change the birth threshold uh, to change how much things fill in. So the lower we take it, the more things will fill. The higher we take it, the less things will fill. Um, and it's important that you're able to just experiment with this sort of thing. Like in game development, never be afraid to try something and have it break, because um, that's how you learn <laughs> and how you find the right way to go. So what if we do a much larger map with the same sort of principle? Um, these values are slightly different um, and the tile size is much smaller, as you can see. Um, and we can create these kind of decent looking caves, actually. <laughs> um, and this is like really not that much work. I'll show you guys the code for this uh, one second. So if we go to our code, where are our things? So, okay. So here is how one iteration works. So we get all of our neighbors, right? Um, this time we don't, we're not, we don't care about bit flags anymore for this. We're just counting the neighbors. So for each neighbor that exists, we're adding one. So at most neighbors can be eight and at least it can be zero. So we check if our current cell is alive. If our cell is alive, then we check if we have less than the death limit or more than the high death limit, we'll kill ourselves. If we are not alive and we, and we have more than the birth limit, um, we will spawn a new cell there. And that's it. <laughs> the rest of this is just like UI stuff um, and irrelevant. And then for the loot placement, um, this is just kind of an aside, but this is actually really simple too. Um, we just, we have a percentage chance of 5%. Um, and so what we do is we go through the map after it's done generating, we go through the map and these little yellow squares are the treasure chests from here. Uh, we just got little, little yellow squares instead. Um, and the way that this works is we check the north, south, east, and west neighbors of a given cell. And if there are more than two neighbors, meaning if we are in some kind of corner or against a wall that's not straight, then we are eligible for treasure. And then we just do a random chance and if it's above our treasure chance of 5%, we spawn a treasure and that's it. And it places treasure throughout the map at random corners, right? And it's like a pretty tolerable method. Um, I guess my point is procedural generation is this big scary topic and it is very complex and there's a lot of depth and breadth to it and there's a lot going on. But in terms of just kind of experimenting, you can make something that's not that bad pretty easily. Like these caves aren't so bad. Now, if you wanted to make guarantees about can you get to every cave from every other cave and stuff like that, you need to do more work. Um, but as a starting point, this isn't bad at all, in my opinion. Uh, and again, we can kind of play with the values to see how it changes things. So if our low death limit is lower, um, we get much more cave and much less cave wall, right? Uh, and I think at some point we just end up with like an empty square, right? With just tons and tons and tons of open space. If we raise that limit higher, um, we end up with no caves whatsoever. Uh, if we change the, the height, I think this will kill everything again, right? Yeah, because it won't allow empty spaces. Uh, if we change the birth rate, right? We can make our caves wider effectively or narrower by putting it closer to the top. So there's just lots of options. Um, I, I would say the most important thing with, oh, a sailing game. 
Yeah. Yeah, they do look like islands, don't they? Yeah. A sailing game would be fun. And dot big bang with our amazing technology. I'm too tired right now to do a good sales pitch. I'm sorry. Something so using the power of Node.js and Visual Studio Code. Um, but anyway, so something I wanted to talk about that I didn't have time for is I was going to talk about using long tiles to generate maps because not only can you use long tiles for like um, visual stuff like your tile sets, but you can make entire rooms and apply long tile rules to those rooms, right? You can make rooms where um, your edge type and corner type are basically just what sort of room is allowed to connect to what sort of other room, and then you can fill up a map with those. Um, there's, a, there's a variant method called Herringbone Wong, developed by Sean Barrett, which allows you to do this sort of thing with rooms that are um, long, like they're longer than they are tall. It's easiest to do this, to do long tiles with square tiles. Um, but there are other options. Let me pull up what I am talking about. Herringbone long tiles. Stop scratching my chair, cat. Uh, and here's a good, here's a nice generated example of a huge, you know, map. Um, but what, 2011, Lord. So here's how the tiles are laid out. Here are some example tiles um, that Sean has made. Uh, and they're long, narrow tiles. And then here's an example map made with those tiles. So each pixel in here is a tile down here, if that makes sense. Um, I was also going to talk about wave function collapse, but I also did not have a time to make an example. So wave function collapse algorithm. Um, so is this what I want? Sure. So wave function collapse, um, from what I am given to understand, <laughs> still uses long tile rules underneath. Um, the difference is in how it applies them. So there are, if you're trying to tile a plane with long tiles, there are different methods. And wave function collapse is one of those methods. Um, the cool thing with wave function collapse is you can give it a sample, like this image of these little buildings, and then it will try to figure out a Wong set and rules for it from that sample. Um, so you can give it just like a little image or in our case, you could give it a little map and then it could generate a bigger map based on the rules it found in the smaller one, if that makes sense. And it works in 3D, etc. cetera. Um, it's really, really cool. This is not the page I wanted. GitHub, a function collapse. Okay, this is a bit better and shows a bunch of examples with GIFs. GIFs are great. Yeah, it is pretty simple. Um, so it's just you have like probability distributions for all of the unfilled spaces in the map. And just every iteration, you pick whatever the least contested change to the map is. So basically what, whatever tile has the highest probability thing, you do that thing to it. And then that change will change the remaining probability distributions based on the Wong rules, right? So you give it this little image of three houses and then it creates this map with variably spaced houses, for example. It creates these weird bricks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I did not have time to implement this, but perhaps for next time, um, if you guys want to talk more about procedural generation stuff, um, I can try to have a couple like finished examples for my next office hours in two weeks uh, but it's up to you guys um let's see there's another sort of algorithm for this and i don't i have never seen a name for this class of algorithm but one other way to generate dungeons is um you just have your big space right and then you go and place rooms in it um and then you connect those rooms. Well, the, I skipped a step. You have a big empty space. You put a bunch of generally rectangular rooms in it, um, more or less randomly. 
Um, and then you go in between all of the rooms in the remaining space and you basically walk through the map generating little hallways, right? And then after you've done that, you can go to all of the rooms and hallways and connect them with doorways and then you have a dungeon. Um, and I cannot find a name for this, but here's a great example, this article here, uh, from the author of Game Programming Patterns, so that's cool. Let me just zoom in a little. Um, and here is what that sort of algorithm looks like. I don't, I cannot find a name, but I've seen numerous articles over the years uh, about this sort of thing, and various games have used it. Um, but he places us some rooms, and then he walks through and makes these little mazes in between, and then he goes back and connects those mazes back to the rooms, right? With this sort of flood fill esque algorithm. I've not seen a name for it. I have been calling it the worm and cinder block method, but that is not a very catchy name. So, let's see. And everything that Charles is saying in the chat is valuable information. Yeah. It's also, uh, I just realized it won't be on the video as well, so that's... Uh, well, I can I can read it, but I, I can't pull off a very good British accent, so I won't even try. Uh, it's Charles says it's also super simple as an algorithm talking about wave function collapse, and the other cool thing there is it's doing it per pixel in those examples, but you can do it per tile or per array, whatever of things. So you can wave function collapse in higher orders than just two D. Yeah, that's correct. Um, there's a lot of cool. I think there's even a 3D example here in the GitHub page somewhere. Um, all of these large images have been generated with this method. And here's a little, oh, it's a tiny picture. But here's a really interesting 3D example. Um, so I will try to have a wave function collapse example written for the next one, uh, or at some point in between. Um, if you guys want to talk more about level generation and stuff, then either in my next office hours or the following one, I can try to do sort of a here's a whole game putting it all together type example, um, because there's a lot more we could talk about with like doing the cave generation stuff. There's a lot more we could talk about um, doing dungeon generation stuff. Um, so just you guys let me know what you would like to talk about next um, or what you would like to see um, in a dot big bang game um, and I'll see what I can put together for you um, This one has been a lot shorter than the previous one um, Does anybody have any questions in particular or anything that they would like to talk about? Dead silence I should ask a question since uh, I always make you ask one. <laughs> I've got to think of one first. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I guess like uh, what? Like, have you have you done any actual procedural generation for games or little experiments you've made before? And uh, and what did you end up using? Did you did you do anything as complicated as stuff you've shown, or did you just do easier stuff? So honestly, up to this point, I've generally only done it experimentally. <laughs> like I, um, like a while ago when I, before I really started like working at Control Z, like I had done an experiment in TypeScript to try to generate, um, like I wanted to make sort of a procedurally generated Dragon Quest style game. So like it would generate a world map, but then it would also generate towns and dungeons and like um, basically a quest line, like underneath that um but i only got as far as the world map um but that used uh that was just like a perlin noise um and tons and tons of auto tiling situation um generally the game projects i've worked on have had bespoke levels um but i do like procedurally generated games when they're good um <laughs> and so this was kind of an opportunity to like go dip my toe a little bit more in some of these things and read about them so absolutely not an expert on any of these topics, um, but kind of trying to give an overview. An example as well, Penny. Hmm. I, can I just show an example of where I've used it? And yeah, sure. Go for explain it. Explain how how like the the 
cool thing is that the stuff Penny has shown here is all uh, like I wouldn't say super complicated because it's not super complicated. Yeah, it's all pretty it's simple. All, it's all pretty simple, but it's all also uh, kind of at an algorithmic level of procedure generation. And you can be much, much stupider and stupider stuff ships in commercial games. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> if I share my screen, hang on, let me actually get it like, uh, I just realized that I probably would have just immediately shown everybody my exciting thing. So what am I looking for? <laughs> yeah. Like, is that? Wow, there's an actual in development version of it. That's amazing. Um, I'm just trying to find a decent view of it. I'll just copy you a link, Penny, rather than <laughs> sharing. Okay. That's probably easier. Um, holy heck, what am I going to do? I'll just slam it in, in related, and you can open it so that people on the video can see it. Um, on the Discord, yeah. So Eve Online, I designed and made uh, the kind of hacking mini game for it, and this has a procedurally generated board. So this kind of like view of uh, the board here with all the nodes on it is just entirely procedurally generated. And all I do to procedurally generate that is use a technique called a drunk walk. <laughs> where you pick a starting tile and just move to randomly other randomly move to other tiles um, and that just means you just generate kind of like one of these random sort of spaces and this is a small there's only a few nodes here and like the important thing was that they need to all be interconnected because you're essentially acting as a computer virus going into a system and tra traversing the nodes and it's a bit like a little kind of like roguelite kind of roguelike kind of bit of gameplay there uh, to run through, find the system core and destroy it in order to like unlock the container or whatever it is you're actually hacking at the time. Um, and so, yeah, I, I started off with just a drunk walk to generate these kind of caves. A drunk walk is actually just a really good way of generating these kind of interconnected cave systems, kind of like the, the stuff generated uh, with the cellular automata, na na na. Um, but it's just a very simple algorithm. You go, okay, I'm gonna walk, uh, I'm gonna pick a starting location, and I'll go to one of my neighbors, and then I'll pick another direction, and I'll go in that direction, and then I'll pick another direction, I'll go in that direction. Uh, and you just kind of like randomly walk around the map, and uh, those are essentially either your empty space or your contain uh, or your like walls depending on what you want to make uh, and it generates these kind of like cave like ideas and i did do a bit of additional stuff to it so i pruned out some of the links if just based on some uh, of my own heuristics uh, like nothing nothing clever just like okay if there's too many like triple links or whatever just take some of them out if uh, things I've just ended up with one link. Maybe see if I can find a second link to to add onto them, just so that uh, you ended up with like, if you, you came across a node that was bad, you could circumvent it and all of this sort of thing. And then just had some rules about how I placed like the start location, the end location, and everything in between. So it was very, 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 very simple rules to generate. And one of the main things. For all of this stuff is and penny said it as well as just uh you just you want to do the the simplest thing that gets the result you want you don't want to go okay well i what i need to do is use wave function collapse to generate this and i need to come up with like a great sample of what i want to do and uh then just get bogged down in all of those sort of details about like trying to make this one uh technique work you just you want to start if anything at the, the simpler end of stuff and then see if that works or not and go up the hierarchy of, uh, of things that fit your problem uh, until you actually solve your problem uh, whether that's like doing a drunk walk or whether that's doing pearl and noise or whether that's doing like a cellular autonomous I could not say that cellular autonomous uh, based approach or if it's something like 
way off in the thing. I think like for dungeon generation, like the other interesting one is uh, is some of these sort of physicsy things that try and push rooms out across from one another until they reach like a balance point of being uh, like kind of pushing each other away in a kind of like force fieldy, magneticy kind of way to to generate kind of room layouts, and then you can grid them together with. Uh, with the maze stuff as well. I'm just rambling now. Um, but yeah, always do stuff simpler. Always do stuff simpler. I think that's a good, <laughs> just general lesson. <laughs> All right, well, if nobody has any other questions, um, I'll probably go ahead and call it here for today. Um, you guys let me know if there's anything particular you would like covered next time um, or if there's another topic you would like to talk about instead just let me know um, and thanks for hanging out everybody and I'll see you in the next one bye bye Penny that was awesome thank you